from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. I'm delighted to introduce Fred Bowen today, who has been writing weekly sports columns for Kids Post since the section began in, two, in April of 2000. If my math is right, that means he's written about 675 columns. Now that may, say, <laughs> that may seem like a lot, but I don't see Fred slowing down anytime soon. I think he might have the longevity of Shirley Povich, who was still writing sports columns at age 92. In Fred's <laughs> column, not only does he write about big sports events, but he also explains history. He recently highlighted Lou Gehrig's Luckiest Man speech. He also tells readers about timeless sports lessons, such as how it's important to play your best even when you're not going to make the playoffs. Strangely enough, the Nats have gone 24 and 11 since Fred wrote that column. Yeah. <laughs> Those timeless lessons with a bit of sports history mixed in are what make his 18 sports fiction books so compelling. His most recent book, Perfect Game, features a young pitcher named Isaac who gets upset with his teammates and with himself in his quest to pitch a rare thing called a perfect game where none of the opposing players gets on base. Isaac's focus begins to change after he starts helping out with a basketball team that includes disabled players. They're not perfect, but they don't give up. Fred's books are the product of a lifelong love of sports. He grew up playing youth sports in Massachusetts, where he was a die-hard Red Sox fan. He also coached his two kids, who are now grown, on more than 30 baseball, softball, basketball, and soccer teams. And now he roots for the hometown Redskins, Capitals, and Nationals. Please join me in welcoming Fred Bowen. Am I plugged in? Am I plugged in? All right, great. All right, thank you. Thank you uh, for everybody here. I am delighted to see the patrols here. I feel safe. Uh, that's right, my name's Fred Bowen, and I do a lot of different things. I uh, write uh, 18 kids' sports books. In fact, uh, if you show the switch the thing, already my uh, speech is disappearing. Uh, and what they do is they combine sports fiction, sports history, and there's always a chapter of sports history in the back. Uh, the ones that you see on the screen right now, you can see that I write my books about four different sports. I write them about baseball, I write them about soccer, football, and basketball. Now those are the most popular sports. I get lots of people who say to me, they'll say, oh, could you write a lacrosse book? By the way, who wants a lacrosse book out there? Ah, uh, some people do. Some kids want swimming books. Who wants a swimming book? Ah, uh, okay. One time a woman came up to me and said, will you write a bowling book for my son? And I said, wow, I don't think you know much about marketing. Let's see. Uh, go to the next screen here. These are some of the older books. Uh, they were about basketball and baseball. I also wrote for uh, the next screen here is, go ahead. I wrote a uh, picture book on Ted Williams, who was a great uh, Boston Red Sox slugger, and in fact, I had to write it because I was from Massachusetts, and yes, I'm a huge uh, Boston uh, Red Sox fan. And you can switch now, as uh, Christina said, she's my boss, by the way, so you have to be nice to her. I write every week for the Kids Post. Who, by the way, reads the Kids Post here? All right, good, I see lots of adult hands out there. One time, an adult said to me, he says, oh, of course I read the Kids Post, Fred because when the Kids Post explained the banking system, it was the first time I ever understood it. And so, uh, and that's just, that's been a tremendous amount of fun. And I, I write about all different sports in, in the column. But lots of times when you're a writer for kids, I go to schools and I talk about the writing process and kids ask you a lot of questions. 
And one of the first questions they ask you, how old are you? <laughs> and that, if you think of it, for kids, that's a really important thing. Because it's really, hey, it's, you can do a lot more when you're 12 than when you're 8. But I'm crazy enough, what I say is, well, how old do you think I am? And I have gotten guesses everywhere from 25 to 80. And I'm so happy that you laughed at 80. Because sometimes somebody's out there probably thinking, I give, oh, he's probably 72, something like that. But no, uh, you get lots of questions like that. Another one that you get is, are you rich? And one time before I could answer, a kid just shouted out, oh, of course he is. And I said, well, I didn't want to explain it to him. Another question that you get is, did you always want to be a writer? And I'll say, no, no way I wanted to be a writer. I grew up, and in fact, you can show the next uh, picture there. I grew up in a large Irish Catholic family in Marblehead, Massachusetts. And anybody who's old enough to have lived through the 1950s knows that large Irish Catholic family is a redundant statement. <laughs> All Irish Catholic families were large. We were one of them. And in fact, seven wasn't even that big a, big a number. The McCluskeys, they had like 10 kids. The McNulty's, nobody knew how many kids were in that house. Just one would come out every spring. So there were lots of big families. And we, it was great fun to be in a big family like that. And we played lots of different sports. And so when I was growing up, I didn't want to be a writer. I wanted to be a baseball player. And that is me with my older brother, Rich. And uh, I was the bat boy on Rich's Little League team. And that day that the picture was taken, the coach's wife had made that uniform for me. So you are looking at the happiest boy in the history of the world. It was, oh, I felt so great to be in that uh, uniform. And in fact, I remember what I did. I, my ambition was I wanted to play second base for the Boston Red Sox. And I figured the Boston Red Sox second baseman at that time was a guy named Chuck Schilling. And he was skinny, and he couldn't hit. And I figured, hey, I'm skinny, and I can't hit. I'll play for the Red Sox. Well, it didn't turn out that way. Actually, go to the next one. When I wasn't dreaming about being a uh, baseball player, I was dreaming about being a football player. But it didn't work out that way. I love sports, but like a lot of kids, Sports didn't love me back as much as, uh, as I love sports. And so uh, I actually uh, didn't become a big sports star. I went to uh, law school, and I became a lawyer, which brings up another question. And that is, is it more fun to be a lawyer or to be a kid's writer? And I answer this that question this way all the time. Every time I go to a school, somebody will come up to me and say, the kids are so excited that you're here. And believe me, in 30 years of being a lawyer, no one ever said that to me, <laughs> ever. They all go, oh man, the lawyers are here. We must be in trouble. So <laughs> that didn't, re it's a little different. One of the other things, though, that I did was I got married, I had kids, and I became a coach. And I'll tell you, being a coach is terrific research for what I do. I coached more than 30 different teams. And one of the first things you learn is that kids think differently than the coaches. I remember in the first game that I ever coached, it was a uh, first basketball game I ever coached, I woke up that morning and I thought, I don't usually pray, but I prayed that morning and I said, God, I'm not asking for much. I don't want a big victory. The kids were like in the first grade. All I want is one basket. I want something for the kids to celebrate. 
And that day, God was silent. We lost 10 to nothing. And like the good coach, I got my boys, I got them together, and I said, hey, all right, shake the hands with the other team. And I remember one of my kids, Jeremy, said, why should we shake their hand? They didn't even let us score a basket. And I thought, wow, he's really thinking a little bit different than that. But uh, one of the things that coaching reminded me was how many kids love sports. We got a lot of kids here. How many kids like sports here? Look at all those hands. How many kids play sports? A lot of hands. They really love sports, and they really learn a lot from sports. And that's why, like Christina said, and don't tell the kids this that much, I do put a lesson in all the uh, uh, books, because kids learn a lot from sports. I'm going to talk about my last three books, and then I'll take questions. This one is called Quarterback Season, and what it's about is about a kid named Matt, who the first day of school, he gets some bad news. His English teacher says, you have to keep a journal. You have to write something down every, every couple of days, and Matt does not want to keep a journal. And then what happens is his teacher asks him, said, well, what do you like? And he says, I like football. I'm going to be the quarterback. And so she says, write about that. And so the book is Matt's journal entries going to his teacher, Ms. Ignowski, and Ms. Ig writing back to him. And what they find out is Matt starts to like to write, and Ms. Ig starts to like football. And the history part of it was there was a book called Instant Replay that was written about 45 years ago, and a football player, Jerry Kramer, kept a diary of his football season, and it was on the New York Times bestseller list for more than 30 weeks. So people have been interested in sports for a long, long time. Next one. This one's a soccer book. And I got it. Oh, no, we got next one. There it is. This one's a soccer book, and it's called Go for the Goal. And what it's about is about a couple of kids who make a travel team or a select team, and they think, oh, we are going to have a great team this year. But the team isn't coming together until they learn about the 1999 women's uh, World Cup team, U.S. Women's World Cup team, who had a coach whose only job was to make the players into better teammates. And so what this coach did was she had team building exercises, some of which had nothing to do with soccer. She'd like lay out a rope about this high, and then she'd challenge the team, say, you all have to get over the rope but you have to do it together. You all have to be connected. And so the team had to learn how to communicate. They had to learn how to work together. They sometimes had to learn about, hey, maybe I'm not going to be the first person. Maybe I'm not going to be the star of this. I'm just going to be a helper. And the last thing I want to talk about is my most recent book. Go ahead. It's called Perfect Game. <coughs> and what it's about is about a kid named Isaac who, as Christina said, he really wants to write or he wants to pitch a perfect game. And that is no hits, no errors, no walks, nobody gets on base. And only 23 people have done it in the history of the major leagues. So it's very, very hard to do. And sure enough, when Isaac falls short, he gets mad. He gets upset. So his coach says to him, he says, Isaac, will you help me with a basketball team? And Isaac says, well, I'm not as good at basketball. I'm much better at baseball. He says, well, I think uh, the basketball team would be good for you. And what the basketball team is, is a unified sports basketball team. Now, I'll ask people, adults too, who's ever heard of unified sports? Unified Sports is a wonderful Special Olympics uh, program 
in which kids with intellectual disabilities play with kids who don't have intellectual disabilities. And they have to come together and they play together as teammates. And I tried to write this book about 13 years ago. And I had the idea for a book, for the book, and I thought I was really good. And I, I tried it, but I didn't know enough about Special Olympics and unified sports to write the book. And so I know what the kids are going to comes next. They're going to know I had to do some research. In other words, I had to learn more about unified sports. And the way I did the research was I watched unified sports basketball teams. In fact, there are a bunch of them. They play every winter up at the Landon School in Bethesda. And I spent many weekends watching a unified sports team at Blessed Sacrament uh, Church in Chevy Chase. And you know what? Like all research, I learned a lot. I went into this book thinking, kind of thinking that most Special Olympics kids were kind of all the same. But as I watched the kids, I realized, oh, wait a second. There are all sorts of different personalities out there. Sometimes you get the kids who are kind of the bullies. Sometimes you get the nice kids. Sometimes you get the kids who want to play. Sometimes you get the kids who couldn't care about playing at all. They're just, they're like any kids. And I was able, because of the research, I was able to bring those personalities into uh, the book. The other thing I learned was that so many of the kids, unlike kids now in sports, so much, we put so much emphasis on winning. We put so much, in fact, I always say to people, I'll say, who can remember who came in fourth place in the Olympics? Sometimes somebody will come in fourth place, they'll interview the person and they'll say, you must be really disappointed that you didn't get a medal. And sometimes I wish the person would say, wait a second, I'm the fourth best in the world at something. Can anybody say that? And we say, oh, no, you, you lost. You lost. We put so much emphasis on winning. One of the things that's wonderful about unified sports, they celebrate everything. A kid, sometimes kids getting closer to a basket is something to celebrate. And in fact, what they really celebrate, and we ought to do it much more as just a sports culture, we should celebrate effort. And that's what those kids do. And that was something that I learned when I was there. And I think that if we could bring that to all our games, instead of saying, well, did you win? Say, well, did you, did you give your best effort? Because when you give your best effort, really, that's really what uh, winning's all about. So those are the books. I will take questions now. Is, is there a, uh, a microphone where there can, uh, people can get uh, questions from? And don't be shy about it. I'll take them from adults or from kids. Ah, or people with orange shirts. <laughs> who, by the way, who chose the color? Orange really sticks out, I'll tell you. No, but would somebody like to ask a question? Right here, over here. Oh, there you go. Step up to the mic, as we say. Are you going to ask a question? OK, go ahead. What's your favorite sports book that you wrote? What's my favorite? Sports book that you wrote. Oh, my favorite book that I wrote. Oh, that's such a hard question because I love them all. Uh, but I'm, uh, I'll give you a few answers to that. One is I'm very proud that uh, kids like all the different books. In other words, there isn't just one that they say, oh, that's the one we like. And so I'm very proud of that. Also, there was a very famous writer who, years ago, when he was asked that question, he had written like 60 books. He said, my favorite book is the next book. I, I'm going to get the next book perfect. And in fact, I've, uh, I'm working on a football book. Who wants a football book? 
All right, a lot of Redskins fans out there. All right, go ahead. Ah, the patrol. Where did you get all your inspiration? Oh, where did I get the inspiration? Actually, I got a lot of inspiration when I was, uh, when my son, who is now 29 years old, when he was growing up, I was reading him kids' sports books, and I didn't think they were very good. I thought, gee, I could write a better sports book than this. And so, uh, so I tried. And I gave my first, the first try to my son. Uh, and I said, hey, Liam, will you look at this book and will you uh, tell me what you think of it? And you know what he told me? I thought he was going to say, oh, Dad, this is the greatest book ever. And he said, Dad, you need more games in this book. <laughs> Kids like to read about games. And you know what? He was right. He was right. We'll take another question in back there. Go ahead. Um, when did you start making books? When did I start making books? I started, actually it was interesting, I started writing, actually probably when I was about your age, when I was in school and stuff, uh, but that was just for school. And then when I went to high school, I was on the school newspaper and I wrote about sports. Uh, then when I was about uh, years ago, my wife was a journalist and I was at a party, and her editor came over and said, hey, how would you like to write movie reviews? How would you like to get paid to go to the movies? And I thought that sounded pretty cool. So I did that for a few years before I started writing the books, but that was something that got me started uh, with writing. So, uh, and then uh, my first book was uh, published 17 years ago. It's funny how the decades sort of catch up with you. Okay, does that answer your question? Yeah. We're going to go to the next one? Oh, Robert Griffin Jr. is in the house. I, I, I'm not a Redskins fan. I just have a huge <laughs> jersey collection. Okay. <laughs> you know, one of, my first, one of my first articles for the Kids Post was, I said, there ought to be a rule that uh, you, if you wear the hat, you have to be a fan. You know, because there was a kid, like at my uh, grocery store, he had her Boston Red Sox hat on, and I said, hey, the socks are gr going great. And he says, oh, I just like the B. <laughs> but go ahead. Okay, um, how many columns a week do you write for Kids Post? I write one column a week. Uh, and uh, actually, you know, one of the things, if you write a column, um, some people say, oh, how do you get the idea for the column? You know what's the hardest part about writing a column? Is deciding what idea you want to write about. Because I'll, I'll have lots of different ideas for things to write about. In fact, I was thinking, if the Redskins lose this weekend, I was thinking of writing a column about, well, what you could do with the three and a half hours a week you're going to save not watching the Redskins. And I thought, hey, that's a pretty good idea for a column. So that's not a bad one, huh? And I have one more question. One more question? All right, one more. How old are you? How old, <laughs> how old do you think I am? 78 and a half. <laughs> can, he, can he be removed from the house? No. <laughs> Wait, will my question be answered? Will my question be answered? I just turned 60 last month. Okay. And I know what all the kids are thinking out there. Boy, I hope I look that good when I'm 60. <laughs> oh, and follow me on Twitter, twitter.com. Oh, come um, on. Get that. Bye, buddy, Jim. Let, next run, next run. <laughs> Where did you get the inspiration for Perfect Game? Oh, where did I get the inspiration for Perfect Game? Actually, it was interesting, <clears throat> since I did so much coaching, and also since my kids were at a certain age, I thought that there was a lot of pressure on kids to be perfect, to get all A's, to, be, uh, to never make mistakes, to, uh, to do well in sports, all those things. And I thought that, you know what? Being perfect sometimes, that isn't, you want to try your best, but being perfect is an impossible standard. And so I thought that I wanted to write a book that part of the message would be that you don't have to be perfect all the time. Uh, you know, you can make mistakes, everybody makes them. And uh, 
I, I just thought that was going to be a, a good message uh, for kids. All right? Of course, you're perfect, right? <laughs> yeah, okay. Go ahead. Um, how did you, um, what did you have to do to get into the newspa newspaper, and what did you have to do to get the copyrights to publish your books? Okay. Uh, oh, wait a second. That's a lawyer's question. Uh, let me see. Uh, actually, I'll, I'll answer about getting into the newspaper, and that was uh, uh, the editors, when they started the Kids Post, knew about my uh, books. And so they wanted to talk to me about maybe writing for the newspaper. And uh, actually, they said, would you write for us every once in a while? I said, no, nah, I don't want to do that. I want to write every week. And they loved the idea of a column. And uh, I remember I gave them, they said, well, what would you write about? And I took out of my uh, coat pocket a list of about 40 ideas. Uh, so I'd pick any one of them. And I've been doing it ever since, and it's really great. Copyright, my publisher gets the copyright. I'm not sure what happens with that. And, um, and I have one more question. Oh, man, these guys are tough. All right. and, um, can You're you write next. a book about the game Squash? Could I write about Squash? Actually, there's a guy, uh, Dave Keating, who I just, I went to watch uh, Squash matches just last uh, weekend, and I'm, I think I'll write a column on Squash uh, sometime, because there's a very active uh, Squash community right around D.C., but I, I'm doing some research on that. Okay, go ahead. Are we almost uh, two minutes? What's your favorite sport out of football, baseball, soccer, <coughs> in soccer? Well, are those actually to watch? I like uh, uh, I like baseball uh, the most. I'm a big baseball fan. I like uh, soccer and I like uh, football. One thing I'm getting really scared about with football, it's getting very, very. You know, I mean, so many people get hurt, and I've written about concussions and I've written about injuries with uh, football. Uh, so I'm a little worried about that. But go ahead. Uh, I'm a writer from Taiwan. Uh, oh. I would like to know, how long do you finish one book? How long does it take me to finish a book? Well, you know, it depends. I mean, I had the idea for Perfect Game 13 years ago, and it took me 13 years. But usually it takes, uh, I've had many years where I've done two books a year, so it takes me about six months to, to do a book. Uh, you know, I mean, it used to, I, I also wrote them when I was a lawyer, and it would usually, I'd only write for about an hour a day. So uh, I, I'd say the general answer is about six months. Thank you. Oh, Second thank you. Question. Uh, oh, how, <laughs> how do you get your first book published in the United States? Oh, how do you get a book published in the United States? Well, actually, everybody and all the people who are at the book festival and stuff, there are lots of people who are interested in getting a book published. And actually, kids sometimes are interested in getting books published. And what you have to do is you send uh, the manuscript to a publisher. And lots of times they say no. And in fact, with my first book, TJ's Secret Pitch, they said no 17 times. 17 different publishers said no. And, but sometimes they give you uh, uh, suggestions, and I took some of those suggestions, and I changed the book some. And all the congratulations on the persistence, I was ready to quit. Say, oh, everybody doesn't want my book. My wife wasn't ready to quit. And it was fun, yeah. My wife wasn't ready to quit. And in fact, it was funny when I, uh, I was about to throw out those 17 rejection letters a couple of years ago. And I said to Peggy, I said, Peggy, can we throw these rejection letters out? And she said, no, we want to remember those rejection letters. So it's sometimes very, very hard to get a book published. but. Uh, it's a lot of fun. I can't take all the questions. The next person, by the way, coming up, overtime, next person coming up, you should stick around, is Kadir Nelson. I can promise you. All right, first of all, his book, uh, what was it? We Are the Ship is one of the best kids' books I've ever read. He is younger than me. He is probably more talented. And I got to admit this, he's better looking. All right, so stick around. Thank you very much. I'll be signing books at uh, 11 o'clock, so perfect game.
Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.